Welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Stefano, and this is Will Leaders Talk, a podcast about leadership, but most importantly, about leaders. Episode four, and we have a great guest, Sadiq Sadiqi. Sadiq was the uh, spokesperson for the uh, Afghan president from 2019 to 2021, and then he became deputy minister of interior until the Taliban's came and took power in Kabul and the whole country. And Sadiq was forced to flee the country, and now he lives with his family safely in Canada. The conversation with Sadiq is just amazing. The conversation on leadership is never personal for him. It's always about Afghanistan, the history of his country, the failures, the challenges, and the future that he still have as hope uh, in, inside his heart. Talking about leadership, Credibility is one of the main factors, and you will hear Sadiq repeating this word many, many times because for a political leader, its credibility is the most important value and characteristic. Sadiq is just amazing. The flame of patriotism is still burning strong and inside of him, and you will hear him talking about Afghanistan so many times. I've tried uh, a few times to bring the discussion to individual level, but as I said, for him, everything is about Afghanistan. He's the real public servant. So I really hope you will enjoy this conversation as at least as much as I enjoy it. And well, have fun. Ciao. Okay, so Welcome, Sadiq. Welcome to Win Leaders Talk, and uh, we are so glad to have you here. Hi, Stefano. I'm very glad to be part of this as well. So, uh, long time no see after we were together and at the NDO, and it's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Likewise, likewise. I'm very happy you accepted this invitation. Also because, you know, this podcast is about leadership, and most importantly, leaders, as I all normally say, and what I really like is the possibility to interview people with different backgrounds, different coming from different places and these kind of things. And I guess you are a very special guest in this, in this podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, so I guess we can start with uh, this interview. And I have an initial question. That's the question that I like to ask to everyone because I like to listen to their replies. So, and the question is, what is your definition of leadership, if you have one? Yes, definitely. I think uh, we all have some beliefs in our minds about the essence of a good leadership. But I believe that um, there are so many things that we have to talk about it. Uh, but the first thing comes to my mind is, is leadership is an art. You know, it's a process. It's a social process. It's something that turn people, men and women, into, uh, into leaders. Um, so I, I, in my belief, uh, it's an art. Um, you know, uh, some would say that leaders are born. I will not agree with that because I think leaders are made through the times. Uh, and I think it's a process of how somebody can, um, uh, you know, uh, sail the ship in a proper way. So it's actually how you deliver, how you define your goals and objectives, and then how you deliver and how do you achieve that. So uh, having said that, um, it, it is an art. I will again say, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful art and it's learned. So people can learn um, to become a leader. That's great. I mean, you touch upon a couple of things that I, I really agree. Like the first one is, as you say, leaders are made. Uh, someone might be born with, uh, you know, the right attitude, the right um, characteristics and personality. But if you're not, that doesn't mean that you cannot become a leader, a successful leader. And the other thing, of course, I, I love is that you mentioned ships and you know, it's like sailing on the, on the, on the ship. Okay. So you have a great experience and you have the experience to the leadership from a political point of view. What is special about this? What is, what is the special attribute that leaders, political leaders should have? 
I think for the political leaders um, everywhere, um, name it Afghanistan or anywhere else, it is so important to have the uh, ability to um, demonstrate credibility in terms of uh, their action, in terms of, you know, understanding the people and in terms of what they can contribute. So it's not very personal that some leaders in different parts of the world may um, concur that, you know, uh, let's do it for the sake of politics around us. But I think it's not politics. It's more built on the bricks of the trust and how to serve the populations and how to serve your countries, or even if you are a corporate leader. So the sense are the same. Um, so yes, I did work with so many uh, politicians in my country, um, with some leaders in my country, and lastly, with the president of Afghanistan in a very difficult times. Um, and when you, once you work, you, you do observe the difference and variety of char characteristics of that person as a leader. Of course, you al also search into uh, some of the sense that to find out flaws and to see if that leader in a difficult and, and very difficult circumstances can handle that, that issues or lead a country to, as to, to prosperity. So I think having said that, um, I will go to, to again emphasize on the credibility. Again, I will emphasize on the, on the quality of leadership and op absolutely the understanding of your people. So that comes core of the issue, I believe. Credibility is a, is a great and powerful word, but you know, how as a politician can you build credibility? Especially in a, in a, in a country like Afghanistan, uh, you know, you had to compromise stability with change because you were looking for, you, you were, you tried to stabilize the country and at the same time introduce changes in what was the culture of Afghanistan and the political structure. So how can you achieve credibility in such a complex environment? It is difficult, of course, but it's, it's doable. I think um, in my country, in the history of my country, if, if, if you look at it in the, in the past two centuries at least, uh, we've been failing um, our nation uh, constantly. So the lack of trust on the politicians, the lack of credibility of group of people that they call themselves as politicians actually have contributed to the misery um, of the outcomes. Um, so, so things are very difficult in my part of, uh, of the world. Uh, first of all, our political leaders, they uh, were failing to represent the mass of a, of a population. Uh, they were failing to understand uh, their societies in a way that could um, uh, gain credibility and trust so that to lead them. Uh, and, you know, also, the, as I said earlier, the, um, uh, the, the art of leadership, political leadership, which is very difficult thing, uh, I think that was also missing. So, but if you look at the last 20 years of a new Afghanistan, which was opened up to a modern society, and for the first time, the Afghan people and the Afghan politician and as a country um, opened up to the world, to the values of the global, which uh, were based on democracy, proper leadership and politics. I think that was of an immense challenge because you open up an ultra conservative society to the set of, to the list of things that are so unknown to them that contributes actually to the complexity of, of the situation. But again, uh, I will not say that's a failure, but I will say that was a milestone in the history, in the recent history of Afghanistan, to see how the rest of the, of the world is governed and, and led uh, by, by different nations. And what are the, the fundamentals of achieving a political system in which everybody can live? So that has been lacking in, in my part of the world. So what our political um, motivations uh, and political goals, goals were limited. They were not much socialized within the communities as it is needed and it is done in the rest of the world. Um, so based on those um, 
those uh, statements, I can say we are still learning. Although we have a very, very a rich history of, uh, of conquer, conquerings and, and I don't know, uh, lots of kings and what, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you do not follow the art of the leadership, you then fail. So that failure has been so consistent with us for such a long time. Uh, starting from the 18th century, same thing happens to us. We lack a national leadership. We lack people and, and political movements that could create that national momentum for a country after the, of the, the fall of the empires around us. Then the 19th century goes the same. Uh, we had the same pattern to follow. So we fell into the same patterns of political flaws uh, again in the 19th century. Um, and that continued, unfortunately. Uh, and then now in the 21st century, then we had a, this big chance of, of understanding and sailing the ship to a right, to a right way. But then again, we, we lacked that historical baggage, you know, to, to lead the country. And that's a, I will always claim that we have to learn. We have to stick to the art. If we forget about the art, if we forget about the people and how to lead people, uh, we will be doomed to continued failures in the future as well. Okay, so what you're saying is that basically what was missing um, it was a kind of the culture of leadership, like a solid background that would have allowed the politicians, the president, and all the executive power, legislative power to stay in power, to keep their power, even after the Americans, NATO left the, the country. I, I don't know if it's possible uh, to design this, but the, the, the question I have is, how would you define the leadership? What is special of the leadership for, um, for the Afghan leadership? I'm sorry. I think the speciality that the Afghan leadership, political leadership, I will say, that lacked was authenticity. So authentic, being authentic in a leadership is, is the key. Um, and also the power to, to do the things rightly and understand the complexity of a very different society such as Afghanistan. You have so many ethnic varieties which could be positively used for nation building. Uh, but the problem was our lack of consensus or a lack of political consensus on a, on a political system for the country. So we experienced from kingdoms, then we came to a modern times, you know, to have Republic and then we had democracy and all that. But again, our leaders, they lacked the ability to socialize the idea of a political system in Afghanistan that could, that could bring everyone together and could create the notion that, you know what? what, our variety, our differences can be built upon and we can become a very strong nation as most of the other nations did uh, in the history. So that was a missing piece. The missing piece was to introduce a political system, to agree on a political system in Afghanistan that all the people, all the groups of people in that country could trust, you know? So that, that was missing, it's still missing. Uh, I'm still trying to struggle to understand that what best political system could be introduced to, the, to Afghanistan in order to bring about a political settlement in which every nation of the Afghans could agree upon. The other phenomenon that happened in the recent history was the exposure of Afghanistan political system to the world, to the global stage. For example, at one time, we were dealing with more than 50 countries, mostly Western countries, to, to agree on the next steps on a future political roadmap for the country. So imagine having a, a very difficult backgrounds of, of failing political systems in the country for the past 20, two centuries, then you, you are sitting in a, in a table with the most, the rest of the world, trying to understand what is the best political system and how to lead that country into the future, which is still missing. I remember that I, in every meetings and lots of meetings we had with the representatives of the Western societies, they had their different 
definitions of a future political system and leadership for Afghanistan, absolutely sidelining what we had carried as a historic baggage a, with ourselves. I remember that we had to go to the, um, to the Asian leaders and talk to them differently about the future and how our goals are for the future of, of, the, of the region and, and, and uh, above. Then we had to sit with the, with the US and you know, talk to them and understand the modern way of leadership, political leadership in the country, understanding democracy, bringing all this freedom into Afghanistan, which was never precedented in, in, in the past, and then going to Europe. So we had to talk to so many different European countries you know, to understand uh, what political system is best for Afghanistan you know, to agree upon. So the ability to agree and understand and implement a future political map into in Afghanistan with the rest of the world was a very difficult part of the leadership in Afghanistan, which was absolutely the, the reason why we did not succeed. And, that, uh, and of course, I, there's another chapter to talk why we failed together, but I will say it was only Afghan failure. It's, it's us upon us, and the history has been repeated always um, the same uh, to us. Uh, and it's because we don't know exactly how, how to deal with such a complex environment with so many different actors, you know, and so many different people around us that they are looking at Afghanistan in a very, very different way. Um, Asia looks in Afghanistan in a very different way. Um, you know, Europe has its own interest in Afghanistan. The U.S. has another interest. The, um, you know, the Middle East has its own way of looking at Afghanistan. So, so, so these are the, I think, the, the missing um, points in which we were not able to um, to lead uh, the country. Well, thank you for this honest and humble answer. And also you admitted, I mean, your point of view, of course, of the, uh, the fault from the Afghanistan leadership in you know whatever happened in 2021. And I, I'm forced to ask you a question. We don't talk about geopolitics here, but I have to ask you, what's the situation now in Afghanistan? It's miserable. It's beyond um, understanding. It does not come to that criteria of how the situation could be in the rest of the of the region. Even Afghanistan is now ruled by a very brutal syndicate of of Taliban, which are still in the um, blacklist of the United Nations. They are still a known terrorist organization. Um, so, the, unfortunately, uh, it has become a safe haven for global jihadists right now that could pose threat to any country, to the, to the traditional and non-traditional security of the region and beyond. Unfortunately, the, the women are oppressed. Imagine women are not able to go to, uh, to public life. Girls are banned from school. Girls are banned to go to universities. So this is the situation. So what do you, what do you think from this? Imagine uh, two years ago, uh, women, would make up to 23% of the parliament of Afghanistan. Um, we had millions of students, girls, going to schools. Now we had security forces, almost 7,000 women working in the security forces. We had 400 judges, women. So after that 20 years of, uh, you know, adjusting to the world's global system of values, Suddenly, everything just went to a doomsday, and, and now in a year or so, all those progress um, and, and the public will, people will for having, you know, in, to go to, to accept democracy is just reversed. So the just situation is very gloomy. I think it's, uh, it's, it should be a headache for, the, for those policymakers who are in the world, and especially in the West, um, uh, the, the, the threat of global jihadism is very, very imminent right now. The Taliban have a country in which they have invited uh, global or foreign fighters, including Al-Qaeda, including Daesh. And imagine last August, the leader of Al-Qaeda was killed because he was a guest of the Taliban's interior minister in Kabul in an airstrike. So the situation is, is unfortunately very disappointing and we uh, we are looking at it and we are so sorry for what's happening. 
And we are doing everything to make sure that the people are uh, getting rid of uh, the current circumstances. And this will be a perfect segue for a set of questions about terrorism, international jihadism, and all those uh, terrible phenomena that we can uh, actually see and observe on the news almost almost every day. But actually, I want to you say something very interesting about the role of women in, uh, in the Afghan culture. And you say that 20, 23% of the parliament were women, right? Um, that's, that's a very, actually very high percentage, considering that basically in, in uh, 20 years earlier, you had none. What is the, uh, if you have, you have seen them, you have told to them, what is the added value that these women brought to the political life in Afghanistan? I think that one of the important progress we've had in the past 20 years was the role of um, women's leadership in our community. Imagine uh, two years ago, we had 11 deputy ministers in the cabinet of Afghanistan. We had four cabinet women ministers, very strong leaders. They were very strong. They were able to lead their organization in a very different and better way than the Afghan men and the, better than us. Uh, I, think, I think that was the, the added value um, you will still see them very actively engaged with international community after they were evacuated from Afghanistan. They are very active. They have built um, different councils of women together. They have unified their voices and, uh, and they are um, actively engaging with everyone uh, to, uh, to make sure that the global community understands um, what they have uh, left behind. Um, as a partner. So what we achieved was not alone. We did not do it alone. We um, shed blood and treasure together. It was because of the international community that we had 23% of women in the parliament. It was because of the international and global community engagement and support that we had millions of women going to schools. Um, so it was not just the Afghans. But the international community just showed how to do it. As I said earlier, that we, we were exposed to the global norm, to a democratic norm for the first time in, in our history. And we learned a lot in a very, very little time. Imagine if in 20 years we learned how to have uh, so many elections. We had councils of uh, representatives across the country. We believed uh, on, on electing our leaders, future leaders. We believed in democratic processes to take public offices. So these, are, were, these were just very, very global values that we were opened up and introduced to. And imagine if it continued for another 50, 20 years, Afghanistan in that very difficult region, you know, um, which is contained by a very hard and um, repressive regime of Iran, and that never allows us to be democratic. And then there's a Pakistan, which is controlled by the army, actually. They also see a very democratic Afghanistan as a threat to their political system because they control the political system. I think that's, that's how we emerged. But be, because of, uh, and besides of those existential threats to our democracy, new democracy, we were still able to understand and and bring out, uh, you know, and sail our ship, um, unless you know uh, we were left in the middle of of, of the journey. Uh, it's like you know, it's like uh, leadership is not. Uh, somebody said that I heard it that leadership is is not a destination; it's a journey, right? So the journey has to continue. And we were in the middle of the journey to be more democratic, you know, values and and the right, the human rights, the women's rights, uh, child rights, everything then unfortunately we were just left to the mercy of fate. Again, I, I blame our, ourselves, the, the, the Afghan leadership, political leadership in particular. But then of course, there are some responsibilities to the global leadership that we have to talk about that as well. Uh, you know, the, the leadership of, of, the, of, of the global community, I think they were fed up with, uh, with being engaged with Afghanistan, which is very, very, unfortunate, and that's the biggest um, strategic flaw that we saw. So you mentioned many times, you know, that you had the possibility to interact with people coming from other countries, 
Eastern countries, Western countries, Europeans and Americans and so on and so forth. And you had, you know, you had the privileged stage, if you want, to observe world leaders meeting. Is there any leader from any country that really inspired you? I think we, yes, I think there are leaders that, that could be inspiration, uh, no doubt. Uh, I was looking closely at the emergence of President Obama, you know, as a, as a leader of the United States. I was also very keen to look at the, um, at the French political system as well, the way President Macron was able to, you know, carry on with the Marche. So, yes, there were some, at some points, uh, we were looking at, at the patterns of the global leadership in order to see what, um, what and, and how that can impact the Afghan, Afghan system. Uh, so it's from my, an Afghan view on, on global leadership. I think for the Americans, for the French, for the others, they might be good leaders, but for us, as we had started the partnership and we just started to understand them and know them and you know build relationship with them, I think uh, um, they had they, they they had problems with the way looking at, at Afghanistan. They were not they did not have that that strategic patience for Afghanistan after after investments for so many years. I think they did not get it right uh, at many times. Uh, I have been criticizing uh, the way uh, the global leaders were looking uh, at Afghanistan. Mostly uh, what was happening um, at the White House. So Afghanistan was always impacted by the local politics and especially the politics around the elections in the United States. Uh, so that, um, I think that um, point has to be highlighted. Uh, I remember that when uh, President Obama, and actually I came to the United States for the first time when President Karzai came and I was uh, uh, the, press, um, uh, uh, the press crew to come um, and arrange meetings for, uh, for President Karzai and President Obama for the first time because President Obama was not uh, ready and, and willing to meet our president on that time. So he met President Karzai after a year when he was in office. I think that was a that was the biggest mistake, and we were like, we were so sad and disappointed because Afghanistan was a very important ally of the of the United States. We were on the front lines together to fight terrorism, and we did that. So then we uh, we were not received as an equal partner. But but anyway, we came to the United States, and it was the first meeting, and President Obama was struggling with the idea to to um, devise a strategy for Afghanistan. And I don't know why every leader who came to the United States, to the White House, they had to reassess and they had to go through again, the same pattern of, you know, what should we do uh, with Afghanistan? So I, my conclusion, I could be very wrong. My conclusion is that we were seen as a one year kind of project thing. Whereas Afghanistan's partnership should have been you know, valued as a long-term kind of ally and partnership. So every year we had a new a military commander in Afghanistan, every year. Um, so, so those pieces and those um, uh, details of that kind of leadership on the ground and then connecting those to the, to the biggest uh, global leadership, I think had so many flaws. And the, the unfortunate thing was that the Afghans were not hurt at, at many occasions. So the disparity between what we understand about the country and what they see for us and their policies was always a problem. So we would always wish to have a long-term uh, partnership with the world as always. Uh, but again, we were, um, things were imposed differently, right? So maybe our leadership lacked the convincing, you know, thing to, to convince the world to stay the course, uh, but, I can't, but I think, you know, after 2001, the, the U.S. engaged in Afghanistan, everybody came and we were so happy to see international forces coming up in Afghanistan. That's what we wished as a people. And then in 2003, the Iraq war starts and everything goes back to Iraq. 
And then Iraq becomes a very important battleground for, for the United States and the West. And then the focus on Afghanistan degrades. So there's a lot of lessons that we learned from the global leadership as, as um, also from the Afghan leadership that I hope if, if there's an opportunity for the next time that we as Afghan engage with international community, I think we will be very different people this time. Uh, we will not agree unconditionally with any kind of engagement unless the Afghans are not assured of a long-term partnership, an enduring partnership, and partnership based on values and interest on the both sides, not only one side, right? So imagine just an anecdote. In 1979, when the Russians and, and the Soviets were defeated, with the help of the Afghans, the support of the West, and then the West packed up, you know, and that is just left Afghanistan. After like 10 years of partnership, Afghanistan just left uh, um, to the mercy of fate. And, and then what happened to us? The, you, you, everybody saw what happened. All the tourists came back. So now another 20 years of nice partnership. Yes, we were not very good people. Uh, Afghans are, are good people, very hospitable people. I can say that. But in terms of- I've been there, I've been there delivery, and I can confirm. Yeah, in terms of delivery, of, of political delivery, political leadership, we were so new to that and we were exposed to, to, the, to the globe in a very vast way. Um, but again, we were learning. At the end, we learned. At the, at the end, we learned how to, how to make sure that we take steps as leaders to bring in uh, those reforms. Uh, we had a very good record of reforms in the last years. Uh, at least last 10 years uh, of, of our time. But they were overlooked because there was a hasty process of peace and there was a guy by the name of Mr. Khalilzad who was just running the show and he was trying to take every American soldier out of Afghanistan and he had to agree that with the Taliban, you know, to withdraw. Instead of talking to us, to the, to the government of Afghanistan, that you know what? We value the partnership, we are happy, and let's agree on a plan to withdraw the U.S. forces from Afghanistan. You should have, you should have done it with us, not with the Taliban. Uh, but anyway, there are so many issues that we can talk for hours about the, the flaws of a leadership, you know, the, the wrongs of the leadership, how the leadership are not authentic, how they are doing things that only matters to their popularity. They don't do it for the sake of, you know, um, Humanity, but they do it for, for short-term publicity and short-term election goals and so on. And, and, I, and I blame my, my leaders as well. They were doing the same things, right? So my okay. leaders as well, they were looking at, at those very, very uh, short goals of, you know, uh, pop popularity. Well, and that, that's clear. I mean, you mentioned also, you know, the, the struggle of President Obama with Afghanistan and actually is very well uh, depicted in the book that I'm sure you have read, Obama's War, that is, is, is great. So we've been talking about Afghanistan and the failure of leadership, but let me, let, let's try to go more into an individual dimension of leadership. And uh, I understand that among all the political leaders, you didn't find anyone that was really inspiring. So when you talk, when you think about leadership and leaders, do you have a role model, someone that actually you would like to be? In the um, current world models? No, well, it can be history, it can be in the past, it yeah, can be I, present, it yeah. can be... No, definitely. I think I was very pro Gandhi approach towards you know, socializing the idea of a political system, a political freedom, and the sense of a political uh, construct that can help uh, populations like in India. So he was, so he was a leader uh, that was able to understand his people, uh, which is missing in most part of the world, I, I guess. I, I could be wrong, but I guess that that's a value uh, that, that may be missing right now, but before it could be. Yes, I, he is a role model. Um, uh, when, when I look into the uh, political uh, events of this region, India, Afghanistan was very connected for centuries. Um, we were ruling sometimes that part of the world as well. 
But I think the emerging uh, of Gandhi as a contemporary leader to, uh, to make sure that he understands the future of India and look at India now, what they do and where they are in the world stage, I think that's, that's important. He, in true sense, he carried those quality of leadership, right? You know, he was credible. He was able to, uh, to learn and become a leader. He was not a leader, uh, but he, he became a leader. He understood well his society. By training, by education, he became a leader. He went through that social process of leadership in India. And look what he did. The achievement of Gandhi as a leader in that kind of society is immense, is epic um, in, the, in the history. Right, you need to be also in the right place at the right time <laughs> to be able to exploit definitely, your qualities definitely. as a leader. Okay, definitely. let's let's talk about Sadiq a little bit. Uh, you know, and if you have to describe you as a leader, what kind of leader are you? I wish I was a leader, <laughs> but. but. <laughs> Oh, you I are. Wish, I mean, you were the deputy minister of Indira, yeah, so you yeah. most definitely own, are a leader. Yes, I think you're right. Um, yeah, I wish I become a political leadership. I al I always counted myself as a public servant. So until very lately, I was not really into any political system. You know, in Afghanistan, you have so many uh, factions of political uh, groups, and and I, I don't know based on ethnicity, based on the backgrounds and everything. But I was trying to emerge as somebody, as a public servant. I never joined any political uh, group, any political um, entity. I just wanted to be, you know, to represent a mass of the, of the youth in Afghanistan who could go anywhere if they work hard and even if they are not part of the, of the political groups or ethnic groups. So today, most of the Afghans still do not know which ethnic group I am, right? So it's like, <laughs> I, I speak both languages and I, I, and I represented myself to be as an Afghan. For me, being an Afghan was more important than, than uh, people knowing me from which ethnic background I come, right? So that doesn't, doesn't matter at all. I remember when I became the, the deputy minister for the Ministry of Interior, which was my dream actually, even when we were in, uh, in National War College, I was like, I hoped very much that, you know what, I came to NDU because to go back and become the deputy there and work on the trainings of the police, you know, the policies of the police. Uh, but unfortunately, I was dragged into the palace and I was put as a spokesperson. And I, it's a very That's, different it's, story. It's a great honor, right? I mean, you were the <laughs> spokesperson for President Gant, so. You are a very difficult person, actually, yes. And everybody knew <laughs> that. And, every, and my friends were calling me and I say, how do you go there? Why do you go there? It's difficult to work <laughs> with that leader. And I said, look, you know what? For me, that doesn't have that political backup, doesn't have that ethnic thing, um, I, I see it as an opportunity to serve the country, you know, be there and do something um, that I, I may, may affect the lives of the people in Afghanistan overall. But again, when I went to the, the ministry and then for where I was born, a community of elders came and I like my, my father's village and they came to me and I said, oh, we are so happy. It is very traditional in Afghanistan that the people will come to you and and they will say, and they, they, will, they show their gratitude and, and they show that when you are somewhere from that old village, very like very poor village, they are proud of you. And, and I really respect that. But they said, you know what, now you belong to us and you have to, you know, focus more. And I said, look, I belong to every Afghan in this country. So I please allow me to focus uh, on, on all them. So I was searching for that, um, uh, that time and an opportunity to work. Unfortunately, my time in the ministry was very short because of the, the consequences and because of the fall of the government. Otherwise, I would have, I believe that I would have been contributed more and in, in making um, or revising the, the policies of the police strategies. Although I did some, some work, I looked into different ways. I updated actually the, the code of the conduct for the police for the first time after so many years. And so that I can, you know, 
uh, bring that up to date and, and to the values that we all believed in. A very democratic code of conduct for the Afghan police. You know, uh, and then I went to, to Turkey to, um, uh, you know, negotiate with them uh, to upgrade our education uh, and training in the police, which was very successful meeting. And I was very happy to get lots of support from there, but we were planning to do more, but unfortunately that time did not allow us. Um, so, please. Yeah, sorry. No, so basically you were on your way to become the Afghan. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, I think that's a very, very big um, claim. No, I was trying to, to project and represent myself as someone that can connect Afghans together and probably will be able to introduce um, or to support a political system that every Afghan will agree. So that's the missing piece. I, this is my personal belief that we all Afghans from different backgrounds, from different areas, from different nations, we are struggling to understand the meaning of a political system and leadership into Afghanistan. Some goes to a federal system, some goes with the presidential system. Some people think that, you know what, we need a king to come back. So there are a lot of confusion in my society about the way and the nature of future political systems. And I, I was trying to, you know, in the future, maybe if there are any political, um, political group in Afghanistan or party in Afghanistan that will lead the country, uh, I could be part of it, but that, that was a dream, it still remains a dream. I don't know if, if my generation will be able to reverse all these miseries that are there right now. Well, it takes time, you know. It, surely 20 years were not enough, also because the first years of those 20 were quite violent from many points of views, and probably only the last decade Afghanistan were, was more uh, enjoying kind of uh, a better stability. I've been there, as I said, and it's a, it's a beautiful country, great people, honor, all the people of... It was honored to have you in Afghanistan. It's <laughs> yeah, the, and, and all the people I talked to, and was they were so warm and friendly, and the food is great, is great. Almost uh, as the Italian one, but you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I no, actually, Italian. great food, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. There is a, there is a, a restaurant in Washington this year. I love to go with my wife. Okay, so living food apart, you know, let's go back to leadership because this is what it's uh, about. You've been, uh, you've been mentioning a lot of challenges, political challenges to going, going again to an individual level, which is the biggest challenge that you have faced? I think the biggest challenge uh, that I faced was trying to make sure my leaders uh, would understand what I was uh, telling them about the, about the situation. So my job was very difficult as a spokesperson as well. I had to brief the president on a daily basis um, in a very realistic way um, that how people were thinking, what was the public perception about, about the government of Afghanistan? Uh, people before me, maybe they were not following the same pattern, but I, when I was interviewed by the president, I said, sir, if I come here, so this is, I have witness as well to this circumstance. And I said, if I want to come to be your spokesperson, so I have a couple of small conditions, you know, putting the conditions in front of the president was, is not a big, is not an easy thing. And I said, I will bring more news. They will be very bad news. So do not expect from us to bring you with the good news to come and say, you know what, sir, everything is good and nothing is happening. So that was not, that was not the case. And he said, he agreed. He said, yes, I, I totally understand. So every night we have to send them a brief of how people thought about, about the president and the government. And that was a very difficult thing for me to, to make sure that the president reads all those news. So the couple of pages, you know, the summary of those news uh, by, by mainstream media, by social media, and what the people thought about, about the government. And like every day or every other day when I had a chance to go and, uh, and, and my time to, to talk to the president. So the biggest challenge for me was to make sure that he gets me, he, understand, he understands what I say when I deliver the people's message to him, right? So when, when, when I was explaining things to him, 
um, I think it was difficult for me to understand. And that was the biggest challenge for me to understand or to be sure if he, if he heard me. And if I had that enough credibility, you know, that because it was not only me that, that he would listen to um, the same issue. So, so there were many other players that they would come and they will explain things from different angles to him. Uh, and, I, and I found it very hard uh, as a person, as, as a leader, I will say it. I don't call myself leader, but as a person who was in charge of, of, a, of a press secretary to the president. I, I feel so humble, you know, when I hear you, because until now, when I talk about leadership, coming from my experiences, the most was like, oh, yeah, um, I have been commanding a, um, a ship, you know, a few hundred people. Of, and that's why I consider myself a leader. And then I talk to you and your dimension of leadership. Even when I try to force you to stay to individual uh, dimension is, it, you know, it's like explodes and it becomes so big, so strategic, so political. And the impact that you had or you could have had in the in, in Afghanistan and more, you know, generally speaking, I would say in the world is is amazing. So I really admire you for what you have done and all everything that you have achieved in your in your life. And despite, you know, in the last couple of years you've been forced to live in Canada, you still have this flame burning inside of you. So I have to say this because I, yeah, I really yeah. I came to my mind when I listened to you. The reason, and I really, yeah, the reason that makes us cry is, is we did a lot of things. We worked very hard. It's not me. Like I, I'm talking on behalf of the millions of my generation. They worked very hard to achieve what we achieved. And now just a bunch of terrorists and, and fanatics, they just took over. Like, you know, you built a house. And then these the intruders are just they come and take over everything, and you are you are forced to go out and live in misery. For example, you know, millions of Afghans. That is something that really inflames us. That's something that really burns us, and something that we cannot get it right. That, that why? Um, so so that's like constantly pounding on us. So now, as we say, you you live in in Canada, right? And but you still are a prominent figure for all the Afghan expats. How do you manage this, this position? How do you keep uh, talking to these people? What do you do to keep all those people together? So on yeah, a daily basis, um, I engage with so many um, Afghans, friends, not fr um, you know, even those, those who I don't know. Um, I tweet most of the time. I stay current on the affairs of Afghanistan. I would like to um, remind the international community that what we have lost together, you know, uh, sometimes criticizing them, but, uh, but, you know, just reminding them that what, what is the cost of, of leaving uh, a nation for the second time behind and what will be the future consequences? I just, we and my friends and all of us Afghans who are outside, we try to make sure that there's a uh, that the, the international community understands the importance of re-engaging. We have not lost our hope. I think this period of time is a very dark period, um, uh, but we have to convince the international community, the leaders, of what they have, uh, what they are missing actually. So I stay connected. I do uh, tweets. I write articles. Uh, I talk sometimes uh, to some of the Afghan media. I'm trying to still, you know, um, deliver some hope. I do participate in some uh, spaces, Twitter spaces, in which uh, lots of young people come and they talk about, about the problems we had in the past. They are criticizing, which is valid. And I try to um, tell them the stories, what, what happened. Uh, and I agree with them, with all of them, most of the time. Uh, and I try to, um, you know, paint that, that picture of the future. Uh, like today, I had a very uh, good conversation with a couple of my friends. Um, and I told them, you know what, if uh, I have been reading the Afghan history of the 19th and 20th century, we have always been failing because we lack the knowledge of agreeing uh, upon a, a political roadmap. 
So let's let's work on that. Let's make sure that every Afghan knows what they want. Because uh, ironically, every Afghan is so involved in politics. You ask everyone, they will talk about politics, you know? So I think this are sort of uh, things that I'm stick to every day besides, you know, living away from the country, which is very hard. I never experienced before, uh, but I have to stay connected. As I said earlier, we did a lot. We, uh, we built a lot. We built a home and we cannot just leave it to the hands of these terrorists that they are, they are um, ugly people. I mean, they are brutal. They kill people on daily basis. Um, they imprison people. They kill women. Um, and that people and those people are so nice people. Afghans are nice. I mean, they don't deserve to be ruled by a bunch of fanatics trained in the madrasas, um, trained with hatred, with killings. Uh, and, you know, every Talib is a killing machine. They don't have a law. They don't have a system. There's no, there's no rules for them. Every Talib can just arrest someone and just kill them on the street. It's happening every day on a daily basis. So those things keep us alive and keep us to continue to work, work harder with more lessons learned, and finally find a solution for that beautiful country. It's an amazing country. It's beautiful. It is. It is. And I've been lucky enough to travel around the country and I've seen the mountains in the north. I've seen the part of the forest in the south. It's so beautiful. It is. So um, what is your biggest fear now that you live in Canada? I think the biggest fear is to, to see the, um, the shift in the um, original uh, power struggle um, surrounding us. I, my fear is that the countries are um, looking again into Afghanistan as a, as a um, you know, ground for their rivalries. Uh, my biggest fear is Pakistan and Iran, uh, including uh, Russia. They are trying to um, they are trying to uh, agree on on a uh, on goals to suppress Afghans further because we worked with the West, and my fear is the lack of um, proper attention of the of the uh, uh, United States, especially namely to Afghanistan. So I think these are our fears. Um, my fear is the continuation of the sufferings of the Afghans. We have to stop that, whatever it takes. Um, and we have to work very hard. So these are things that really f uh, makes us, you know, worried um, about the future. Siddiq, once again, I feel so touched by your words um, and uh, I admire your courage, your bravery. And, you know, the fact that now you're living in a different country that is not your country and you still have this, this Afghan flame burning to you, and you don't forget. And you, you're restless, and uh, I really admire you for that. And I'm sure that whoever will listen to this podcast will do the same. We and need friends. We, <laughs> we need friends like you. We need friends to understand us. We need friends to stay with us. And I think um, the world uh, uh, owes us, you know, somehow. It's like the, the humanity, the, based, based on the human humanity, we have to help each other. Like the, the past 20 years, you guys help us. We need more of it. We don't, we don't, have, we don't want to see that stopped, you know. <laughs> That's true. I think let, That's me also, true. let me also just reiterate that I, I admire the, the support of the, uh, our friends and allies since the fall of, the, of, the, of Afghanistan, because... So many people were evacuated. I think that was a great thing to do. There are still people that need evacuation, that need support to leave Afghanistan at this time. And I think that has to continue. Um, so I just want to express my gratitude to those efforts after the fall of, of, of Afghanistan. That's not enough. We need, we need to see more, but at least, you know, that was a great help. And I really hope that this, this more will come from from all the Afghanistan. All, 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 I'm sorry, for all the Afghans and from all the all Western community, NATO, and all the allies of Afghanistan. That is a beautiful country, and I will never stop saying this. 
Okay, we're going towards the end of this of this uh, episode, and there is a last question. Uh, there's another traditional question, if I can call it so. And is you know, just imagine a person coming to you and say, maybe an Afghan person, an Afghan youngster coming to you and say, oh, Mr. Siddiqui, I would love to be a leader. What should I do? What is the suggestion that you can give me? Yeah, I think the first thing I will tell him is, is to learn the art of the leadership. I will tell him to be honest, be authentic. You know, I will tell him to understand um, that being a leader is not granted. It's a responsibility. Um, and I tell them to be more wise, you know, by understanding your people. I will tell him to make sure that, or tell him or her, you know, it's her as well. So, uh, you know, to, to pose that self-awareness and garner the credibility, you know, focus on the relationship with, with their people. So there are a lot of things that I can tell him or tell her to, <laughs> to be a good leader. Uh, and I hope this time the women of Afghanistan will be the leaders of the country because they are the true um, leaders. They can, they proved to be good leaders. And I think Afghanistan will be in much prosperity if uh, the women would lead uh, that country. Well, I really hope that this will happen. No, in not uh, too much time. It will not take too much time. And in a few years, we will meet again in Kabul or in any city Definitely. you want. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. I really would love that. Okay, so thank you again, Sadiq. Thank you again for having been here with us, for sharing your great experience and a such a high level, political, strategic level. It's, it's very difficult to have a sample of this and for the last almost 60 minutes you allowed us to really understand how a person working at this level has not a vision to leadership that is limited to uh, themselves but is like a broader vision that encompasses all the whole country so thank you again city it was such a pleasure to be with you, uh, Stefano, as you are such a good friend. And I wish you all the very much success in your programs and future events. All the best. <laughs>